Kristalinski, one to go. 26 points. Oh my God. 26 on two. Oh, three. Oh my God. All right, hey everybody, this is Chris Derrick from the Bowerman Track Club. Hope everyone is staying safe and sane. We, we can't do much side, or any more than anyone else on the safety front, but hopefully we can help you stay sane with a, a few new videos. So today we're going to be talking about one of the greatest races in American distance running history and Canadian distance running history, the 2010 Peyton Jordan 10K. So to join me with that, we have the stars of the show, uh, Chris Zielinski. He is now the uh, cross country and track and field coach at the University of Florida. Um, and he was an NCAA champion, as you will see. He was the American record holder in the 10,000 meters. And most importantly, he is the only person to win the Bowerman Track Club Fantasy Football League twice in a row. So, Chris, welcome <laughs> on. <laughs> Good to be here. <laughs> All right, sweet. And we also have uh, the other national record set in that race was the Canadian record um, by two time NCAA cross country champion. Uh, Simon Byru and Simon, um, his honor is that he is the greatest troll that I know. So Simon, welcome, welcome <laughs> on board. <laughs> Thanks for having me. All right, so let's uh, let's let's just hop over to the race real quick because since uh, we do have some time and it, as it, as uh, befits a 10k, we'll just kind of we'll talk through the race as we go. All right, team. Uh, so as you guys heard, just heard uh, they sit uh, Ryan Fenton. Says this is the this is the race everyone was anticipating. Uh, I personally was really prepped for it. I was sitting at about the 200 meter mark with Evan Jager. I had a big pizza I had just brought from Pizza My Heart, and I was ready to go. <laughs> what do you, what do you guys remember about the lead up to the race? The in terms of like the anticipation, your levels of anticipation. How much how much did you guys think something special might happen that night? Uh, well, I I remember. Training was going really well. Um, I, I, Simon was coming off a world cross for you, what, 12? Is that right? Yeah. yeah. And, which is obviously really, really freaking good. And uh, Nelly was training better than he's ever trained. And training was going well for me. I was just trying to get ready for a 5 um, I think my entrance into this race was like within the last few weeks beforehand. So I think that's how I feel like I remember is that. You think it's been coming? Yeah, I was, I mean, watching this race right now, I was thinking about how nervous I was at the line, too. I remember just thinking, okay, we just need to get this started so we can kind of start going through the process. But, uh, it's funny yeah. you say you were nervous because I remember I was kind of nervous, but then I look over to you and Nelly and you guys seem cool as a cucumber. And I was like, all right, I'm good. I mean, that's, well, that's the same thing in practice. You never want to show how nervous you really are, right? Yeah. So, it's, so going into this race, who did you think would have the best day? Because I, I know who I thought was going to have the best day, and then I also knew who I thought was going to have the worst day. Oh, I easily thought I was going to have the best day. I was just hoping you would hang on. <laughs> that that was my number one question coming into this: is did Simon actually think that Chris could beat him in the race? Not, you get Honestly, yeah, no. I thought Simon was going to finish DFL. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I thought Chris might have a small chance of doing really well, but then after his dinner the night before, I was like, all right, he's he's definitely just gonna he's done. Yeah, let's talk about that dinner. A legendary dinner in the annals of uh, uh, BTC lore. What what happened, Simon? Tell us about it. So we went to. Did we go to Olive Garden? Do you remember where we went to the the first ball we went to? I remember you you were complaining about how small your meal was, but I yeah, don't remember if it was. It was some like hoity toity Italian restaurant. <laughs> That's in there. right. Um, right there. So, and we were there and it wasn't even good. It was a very, very small portion. I was pretty ticked off. It was a regular sized portion, but for Chris, it was, it was too small. So, as tradition would have it, we had uh, ice cream afterwards. We used to go to TCBY and we usually get what? the small one. No, we went to Cold Stone. Oh, Cold Stone. That's right. Wrong place. Oh, wow. Cold Stone. And then you got the gotta have it, I think, right? You got the biggest one. I did. And I think Jerry was freaking out while you were ordering that one. And he kept telling him to relax. What? Is that right? Chris, yeah. you're running a 10K. <laughs> you got a race tomorrow. What? Tom was there with us. Huh? 
I think Tom was there with us. I don't think Jerry was there. Was it Tom? Because I, like, I feel like I wouldn't have ordered that in front of Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we have our ice cream. He has his Noki. We all had our pasta, and Chris was still hungry. And we're walking back to the hotel, and there was a Little Caesars open. And I think Chris wanted to order a slice, but they only sell them by the box. It was like five dollars for a medium. So I was like, all right, I'll, let's, we'll have a slice each, and then we can save the rest for tomorrow after the race. And uh, honestly, I, all I remember is, like, we got back to the hotel, and I asked Chris, where's the pizza? And he had finished it on the walk from Little Caesars <laughs> to the hotel. We all just looked at him like, what are you doing? Is that right, Chris? Did I get that part right? Well, I think it was you that wanted a pizza pizza. And he was like, if anyone want to split this with me, and I was like, yeah, I'm still hungry. I'll have stuff. And you had like a slice of food, and then yeah, I I had the rest. So I had like six, six or seven slices. And we all just thought, okay, this guy's gonna shit the bed tomorrow. But we were trying to like, we didn't want him to know that, but we all thought, okay, it's over for him. There's no way he's gonna be able to race well after this. <laughs> well, well, little do you know that like some of the best races I've ever run came after like not being able to satisfy my appetite. <laughs> like the night before and the morning of like even the first time I broke four I had a whole large uh, Papa John's pizza the night before then I woke up and had a whole like box of Fruit Loops that morning <laughs> and then, then 357 so is it would you say that it's important to uh, stay hungry if you want to achieve great yeah. things you stay very hungry <laughs> and if my appetite is uh, any telling I've got a really big performance coming through <laughs> um, all right, so let's let's talk a little bit about because um, originally you guys were going to run this 10k. It's going to be in paid. It's going to be in Palo Alto. Uh, at the same time, Galen Rupp was going for he was going to go for the 10,000 meter record. He really wanted to do it in Eugene because um, obviously that's where he went to college. So the whole thing: will they run? Will they not run? Um, I actually, like I said, I was sitting at the 200 meter mark, and I remember in one of the previous races, Alberto was, he was standing on the back stretch, holding his stopwatch around his neck as he does, and he was looking up at the flags, checking to make sure the flags were going to go down, and at Stanford, the, you know, the flag slowly goes down later it gets, and I remember at one point, it finally goes dead, and he kind of like shakes his head like, okay, we can run now. Um, so how did that will they won't they run lead up affect your guys's preparation or did it at all not mine no no i think we jerry was the only one freaking out about it yeah i mean jerry he does he also likes things to be to be a little perfect as we saw at that uh yeah because 5k this past fall yeah. well i also think he, that's why he wasn't at cold zone because he wanted to go to the track at precisely the time we were racing to see what it was going to be like the night before oh, that's right that's right. yeah he was yeah, Jerry had some problems with that kind of stuff. But yeah, like yeah. Chris said, we didn't really think about who was in or not in the race. We had our game plan, and uh, we were just going to run our race. Yeah, I just remember, like, we, it was like a day or two beforehand. That day, like four or five different times, Jerry's like, he's going to come. He's not going to come. He's going to come. He's not going to come. And at the end, I was just like, Jerry, I don't, I don't care. Like, <laughs> So obviously, if they're going for the American record, you know, whatever, that's 27, 13 at the time, I think. Mm -hmm. How prepared did you guys feel for that kind of pace? Well, we had a, we had our, our own pacer, and um, I think right now he's one, two, three, four, five, fifth place, Daniel yeah. Sowell. So like, yeah. um, through uh, Michel Bouting, uh, one of his athletes, he brought him over. He works with Tom every now and then, and... Uh, yeah, we had. I think we had him set up for what twenty seven twenty. Yeah, it was and both. Yeah, twenty seven twenty. Right. Um, so what? So, so was there anything? I mean, you know, people love. They love the training details. They love the workouts, especially with how secretive Jerry is. Uh, so what? Was there anything in the lead up to it that any workout you guys did that kind of convinced you guys that you were really ready to go? Well, the workout that convinced me Simon wasn't ready to go was the the six hundred meter part like. <laughs> <laughs> what was that we did it was like 10 10 11 or 12 i don't remember how many it was exactly but it was 600 100 jobs continuous and we were like i remember if you added up the 600s it was like 13 flat pace and at that point i was like holy crap 
like worth it. And Nelly actually had me on the ropes on that one, and Simon had to stop a few and then jump back on. So I was like, yeah, he's toast. <laughs> Do you remember the, uh, was it the six by mile workout we did? Seven by mile. Seven by mile. That was the one, I think I did six, but that was the one where I knew we were going to be ready to run hard. Do you remember when we said, all right, guys, let's let's agree, no spikes till the fourth one? And I think you led the first one. How fast did you go in the first one? It was way faster than Jerry wanted. Well, I know we started out probably 28. We were supposed to start out. We were probably like, what, low 20s, I guess? I haven't looked at this in a long time. And, and I remember after the first one, we all said, all right, let's just put on our spikes now. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, I, probably, that's... I probably told you guys that and didn't actually do it. Because I, no, I remember I was, for workouts, I always tried to stay in flats longer than everybody else. Yeah, you did. But you didn't put on spikes on this one. You were all about those mind games. So like Chris was 100% mind games. Than everyone else. Yeah. Chris so, was 100% mind games. If you told if Jerry, Jerry would ask us how we felt on long runs. And if Chris heard anybody say they weren't feeling great, the next mile was automatically 10 seconds faster. <laughs> Blood in the water. <laughs> uh, so let's. The kids I coach, they, like, they hear someone else is hurt and they're just like, oh, well, we'll slow down too. Like, what? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, good times. No mercy. So, so, yeah. so, I mean, this is back. This is, um, this is Old Testament Jerry, as we call it. You know, very aerobically based. You guys are probably both. You guys are probably running a lot of miles, right? Because both that was kind of for both of you guys. That was part of what you drew your strength from, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was doing about one twenty badger miles, one fifteen to one twenty. Yeah, what, what what do you think 115, 120 badger miles is? What's your estimate? Probably, I'd say close to 130. Yeah. yeah. I usually said it was about 10 to 15. Yep. Um, and this is, I mean, so I didn't join the, the group until 2012, but I remember when I came in, uh, Andrew Bumbleo, he would always talk about the uh, the reign of terror, which was when, which was, when Solinsky <laughs> was, was really fit uh, in like – I guess he might have meant 2011 at this point, but was this yeah. the uh, this is the stories I always heard? Right, is like you, we run at Nike a lot. You're gonna you're getting ready to come do core, which is at like 10. So you got to get your run in before core. So everyone kind of jumps into the run at different points depending on how far they're going. And Chris, supposedly, I don't know, Simon, you can you can fight this narrative if you want. Supposedly, Chris was always out there just going longer than everyone else, rolling like six minute pace by the time young young Andrew Bumbleo and young Evan Jager <laughs> in the field. And they were just basically fighting Bumby used to say that he would look forward to the workouts because they were easier than the normal runs. Is this is this just all exaggeration in the uh, after the fact or was this was this how it was, Simon? No, uh, it wasn't just the young guys. Me and Tag felt the same way. We <laughs> I remember we would uh, we tell Chris to join us like twenty minutes into our run just so we could warm up for his run. <laughs> it was just we couldn't we couldn't start with him, and then he he would get frustrated. Yeah, but there would be jabs along the way. It's like, are you guys really running this slow? Or like, Chris, we're running six minute pace. I <laughs> uh, forgot about that one. My dad's grandma. <laughs> oh yeah, he's like, you guys, my my grandma can run this pace. What are you guys doing? <laughs> like, Chris, it's it's six oh five, but for Chris, anything slower than five thirty was like a recovery run. No, no, no. no I my thing I always said was, we're professional athletes. We should be able to run six minute pace. So, well, he's run 13.27 for uh, 5K this year. Oh, the 16.39. Damn, they're starting to start taking it down. So, so well, that was last year. Solinsky, 3.20 for the last three laps. 3.20? Solinsky. Losing a step here. That's not right. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. 208 last two laps. <laughs> All right, so so to, to direct our attention to the race a little bit here, this is like we're coming up close to 5K, I think. I think this is probably 11 and a half laps. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, the field is already destroyed. And it looks like, I mean, Simon, you've had to make a couple moves around Nelly here to, like, to, to group back up. Do you, do you remember how you were feeling at this point in the race? Were you just kind of like taking your time because you were in a good rhythm or was there a moment where you're like, oh crap, like this is for real, like the race is happening now? No, that, that moment was at 3K, the oh crap moment. And then uh, I was able to kind of like get my second win. Uh, I think it definitely helped having Chris there and Nelly because those are the guys that train with. So 
kind of helped me gain my composure again. But you see here, there's almost like a, a back and forth where the, dro the group drops me and then I kind of come back in. So I was definitely struggling here. It wasn't, it wasn't as easy. Yeah, I mean, this is some serious business here. I mean, I, I will say that Chris is perhaps the most relaxing person to run behind in the history of running. Just those, he is. Those wide 100%. shoulders, that nice, steady stride. Yeah. Really, it's really comforting. No, um, and that was my goal was just to like, maintain contact. I just kept telling myself, like, just, just stay right behind Chris. Uh, stay as close to Chris. Because I knew once you lose contact in the 10K, it just it goes downhill really quick. So my goal was just to, to stay on that pack no matter what. And I was taking it one lap at a time. So well, I don't know if you guys know this, but that last lap um, was the only time in the race where I was like, "Yeah, I don't know if I can do this," and I and I almost let myself check off, and then I basically was like, "Screw it, I'm gonna go, I don't care," and then I kind of got myself back on it because at yeah. that point, like I, I think that's when I got a cramp, and I was just like, "Yeah, I don't know if I can do this," and I think we heard a 63 somewhere in there, and I was just like, "That's crazy," <laughs> and I was just like, "Screw it, I got nothing to lose." Well, what's your, what's your perspective? Like, so if you're hurting really bad or like a lap feels really fast and you hear, okay, it's two seconds faster than I want, does that make you feel better or worse? Cause for me, it makes me feel better. Like I'm, if I'm coming through and I'm just like, please be a 63, please be a 63. And it's like 66, then that just, that just breaks my soul. What's, I mean, what, what's your thought there? Uh, I don't remember. Like typically I try not to actually pay attention to any lap splits, but if I heard them, I rarely went for time, like, because if I questioned it in terms of, you know, that's a crazy pace, like, I kind of just looked up and saw that Galen was there, and I knew that I could run with him, and uh, I was like, well, if he can do it, then, yeah, I, I'm going to go, but, yeah, I, I, at one point, I was like, if we keep this up, this is suicide. God, Simon, you were just battling right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That heart. Oh, uh, definitely the toughest dude in this race with uh, how many times you got dropped and then got back on. Honestly, a part of me, I think what helped was like knowing Chris was up there and just thinking to myself, okay, it can't be that hard. It's got to be in my head because Chris was still in there. Like, I just, that actually in some way helped me because I kept thinking to myself, okay, you think you're hurting, but you're not. Your training partner's right up here. And I honestly wasn't expecting him to do anything this special i think i told him uh if you ran like 27 40 that'd be a great race was that the time i gave you before the race so Something like that, yeah. yeah so like him being up there i was like i just kept thinking it was in my head what's that i said you could tell i'm hurting because i'm bunched up on so like when i yeah. when i when i would hurt i'd get up on somebody's shoulder yeah i well because this chris chris this is famously your 10k debut on the track yeah. Um, and obviously, like, look, I'm a 10K guy. I'm territorial. When, like, Bumpy yeah. was, was going to debut in the 10K and he was just like, oh, like, I'm going to run. See, I, I would go the opposite way of Simon. I would be like, oh, it's going to be easy. You're going to run 27, 30, no problem. Knowing it was going to be harder and hoping then that, you know, maybe that's a little, that, that's, that's a little sabotage I shouldn't admit to. But when someone steps up to your distance, you don't want them to thrive. You, you want them to respect <laughs> what you've been doing the whole time. Right, Simon? Oh, yeah. I mean, I kept telling them, hey, no matter what happens, it's going to feel easy. You're going to hit a wall in the last two miles, so just stay relaxed. Yeah. Remember, I kept telling them that for the race. Yeah, you're like, it's actually really easy until eight laps to go. Yeah. <laughs> and then we're in a pocket, and I was like, whoa. <laughs> there you go. Gamesmanship. Gamesmanship. No, I mean, I was that was actually an uh, honest assessment. I was like, yeah, the first four miles is going to be pretty easy, and then you're going to hit a wall, so don't, over don't overdo it in the beginning. Yeah, but I you probably weren't was, anticipating going out in 13.30. No. <laughs> I mean, I just always looked at, like, I felt like it felt hard in tempo runs. Like, we did that eight mile up in Fairmont. We did, you know, uh, those long, long tempo runs, like the, what is it, two hours where we warmed up 15, cooled down 15, so 90-minute progression. So it's like, I just kind of was like, okay, this feels the same as that. Like, it hurts, but it feels the same as that. So what, what was that? So Fairmont's, for those who don't know, is a pretty hilly three and a half mile loop. What was that? That like was it a specific tempo at Fairmont you were thinking of, or is it just like you guys, was that a staple workout at that time? No, it, I think it was the only time we did it. Because um, then then after that we started using Savvy's Island, and that Fairmont one. Like I remember we just used it for like the long run progressions, and then Jerry's like, "Yep, we're gonna go a hard tempo," and I want to say we averaged like. 
440 high, 450 low, and I was like, holy <clears throat> crap, I did not think he could run that fast up here. <laughs> and that yeah. gave me a lot of confidence. Yeah, I mean, Fairmont is a pretty spicy, a pretty spicy loop in terms of hills and stuff. Um, starting to move up here, and you can you can tell that I mean, Fenton's getting excited. Don't know what the Canadian this would be. I, I'm pretty sure this would be Canadian record, and I'm speaking without fully knowing, but and it would be we could see three records here. What was that? Sixty-four two. All right, he's picking it back up. Is that Alberto right there yelling? There's that Al looks like Alberto. There's Alberto. Where is he? Right there. Eight, eight laps to go. Here we go. We can see one, an American record, two, a collegiate record, and three, a Canadian record, all right here. All within seconds of one another. Hartman and Gotcher, eight laps to go, 1904. Yeah, after we get this next split, we'll pan around and see where some other guys are. We're starting to lap some runners. Who's this we're lapping? This looks like hip number, th is that three? Three will be Mark Kennelly. Yeah, Mark Kennelly. Is that Ireland? All right, Galen Rupp, Sam Chalanga. Marner trying to hit. And you, looks, is this, is this the breaking point for you right here? What do we you got, like eight laps to go? This is a long way to go. Yeah, I'm, I mean... The last six, seven laps have all felt the same. So it wasn't that it, it felt worse. It's just, I think this is when my body just started to kind of like, you know, realize, okay, this isn't happening today. So what, what well, was the coming on? Because he always puts his chin up and starts praying to God. <laughs> <laughs> like what? I tell my kid, God's not going to help you in this moment. You got to look at the track. <laughs> Simon, what what was the uh, what was the king record before this? It was uh, what was it uh, thirty six? I think it was. Okay. Um, and we were talking before this. You had actually fake broke the Canadian record once when you ran a lap short in uh, in, in Belgium, and everyone for a second thought you ran twenty seven thirty. But this was your yep. chance. To, this was your chance to do it for real. This, this was the real deal here. Yeah, I was, and I was counting my laps. So are you are you looking at the clock at this point, just like? only thinking about uh, 2736 or whatever, or are you still like trying to get as low as you can go, trying to, try to hope someone's going to drop off that path? No, I was, I was just uh, focused on one lap at a time here. I mean, I really wasn't, I was in a whole lot of pain. I think this, this was easily the hardest race that I was in, so I wasn't even looking at, I don't think I looked at the clock till about 800 to go is when I really knew I, I had a shot at it, but I was just trying to maintain contact with the lead group and just, like I said, taking it one lap at a time here. And Chris, it, it, well, I guess you're, you're still crowding slow a little bit, but you, you're definitely, at, at what point do you start to shift over into starting to feel better and better as we're getting closer to the finish line? I, I remember a thought um, with seven laps to go that I was kind of, like, I was kind of hurting, but like I was feeling good enough, but I was still questioning things. And, and I, I remember at that point, um, telling myself like okay it's and it, it was a lie but i was like okay seven laps that's seven minutes i can do anything for seven minutes and i kind of just switched over to being like i don't care what the lap counter says i don't care anything else like i can do anything with anyone for seven minutes and at that point then i started trying to just i knew it was going to hurt so i was like all right i'm going to make it hurt like i'm going to i'm going to put myself in a position to it's going to hurt for a good reason and and Jerry's at like the he's at about the hundred meter mark on the track, um, so about mm -hmm. maybe one hundred fifty meters from where we are now. And at, at a certain point here, you start kind of looking over at him. Did you guys have like a race plan you were supposed to stick to? Were you kind of like waiting for a signal for him to make a move? Well, the day it was either on a shakeout or the day before on pre meet, like we were just talking about race plan. He's like, I just want you to wait till the last hundred meters and then kick the last hundred meters. And, uh, you know, I, I told him that I was good with that, but like in an ideal world, like if I was feeling good, I was going to let him know. And by letting him know, I was going to pull up on Galen's shoulder and sit there a while to let him know that I'm feeling fine and then take off. And I said, I didn't know when it was, but if I was feeling good, it was going to be from a ways out. And uh, it was definitely a weird feeling going into the race because like I actually felt good. Like normally before a race, Jerry would always ask like, how you doing? I'm like, oh, I feel terrible. And 
then it evolves later in my career. They're like, oh, I'm, I'm good enough. I don't feel great, but I'm good enough. And but that, that day, like, and even the day before, I was like, I, I feel really good. And like, had never had that. And if I ever did have that, the race went horrible. So I was nervous for that reason. So as you kind of move up on Galen's shoulder here, do you, do you remember at this point where your mentality was at? Like, are you, obviously you want to win the race. I mean, you yeah, and Galen had a rivalry. But did, 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 was there any part of you that knew how fast you were running and what that mm. meant? I mean, we heard, we heard splits every 200 meters, but like, I, I still have the sheet. I actually, the week before I, I wrote down like what the splits meant. Um, There's a famous Chris clip. Yeah, always, always clipping people. Well, it's because like, I'm hurting and I'm getting up on top of them. My shins are still all scarred up. But um, I actually wrote down what the splits meant because I had no idea what the splits meant. So I did it for like 69, 68, 67, 66, 65. And I remember seeing 65 was 2705 and being like, huh, okay, whatever. And so like I had no idea what we were running. I just wanted to win. Wait. So when you were just past Jerry there, you kind of saw you throw your arm out. Was that was that because you were like get, getting jostled, or were you signaling to Jerry like, "I've got it"? No, I think it was just me trying to keep my feet underneath me. Yeah. Because like with a mile to go, I kind of like I knew I knew I had it in me to beat him, and especially with the fact that he was in front of me, like I knew that if I could sit for however long I wanted to, then I could be able. A make a good move and i was just trying to figure out when would be the best move so this this seems like it's the signal because you're really moving up on his shoulder here and you kind of at some point here you kind of look over at jerry yeah and i, I think it was right there that. yeah yeah and that's when i was i was trying to basically let him know that i was gonna go i'm not gonna lie i've seen this part like a hundred times this is this has got to be one of the most famous clips in running here because ryan fenton is just going insane oh yeah yeah <laughs> Well, you should have had him on. He's, he's the reason this, this race is famous. Like if, if it were just because of us, like, it'd just be like, oh, yeah, that's a cool race. Yeah, re realistically, my part should be played by Fenton, but we can kind of just – we can give him his, his due respect here because he's going, he's going nuts in this last two laps. And it, I think my favorite part is about 400 meters from now when he's like, he's going to run 27.05. There's, like, 200 meters to go in the race, but he's just, like, so frazzled at the idea that someone could run 27 minutes. So did you see me look behind back there, like by where you and Jager and Elliot were? Yeah. So, so with like 6.50 to go, I, I actually looked back because I had a flashback to a race in, I think it was 2007 at Hayward where I, I made the same move and I went too hard and Galen caught me at the line. And so I was like, oh crap, like I better slow down just a little bit to save some, some, some fuel in the tank. And I looked back to see where he was and then saw that I had such a big gap and I was like, all right, I, I'm good. I'm going to go. All right, so with a lap to go, do you know you can break 27 minutes? Nope, no idea. All I heard was six, that I had run 60, and I was like, if that was a 60, like, I wonder what I could run the last lap. Like, it's still at no point that I think about time. I have any idea what time I was running. So at this point, you're just pouring everything into the engine, and it's just it's just giving it all back to you? One of those perfect moments? Yeah, you guys actually helped me a lot going by you guys right there. Like, you fired me up because you guys were, like, going hysterical. I mean, it was one of the most incredible things I've ever seen. All right, let's Great just is when I actually realized what time I was going to run. It took me that long to do the math. <laughs> All right, let's just let it play out here the last time. Maybe. By storm. No one expected to see this tonight. 45, 46, 47. A new American record by Chris Zielinski in what we think to be his 10K debut. 55. He might break 27 minutes. I mean, shout out Ryan Fenton. Just an incredible kid. Just really, really giving the crowd what they wanted. What I want to point out is I saw Edric getting all jacked up. Oh, yeah, he was loving it. <laughs> all right, but Simon, just a soldier fighting out the last seven laps by himself. Did you, what was your perspective? Of what was happening? Were you just totally locked in on your race on you know the Canadian record, or were... Are you aware of what of, did even Chris had even won the race? I actually remember with uh, with when Chris had 300 to go. I remember seeing him and just thinking, "Holy shit!" That was <laughs> that was uh, that was the only time I kind of like got out of my own zone and like was paying attention to the race in front of me. And uh, then when I crossed the finish line, and I was just I don't know if I was more excited for Chris or for myself, but that was just 
I was ecstatic to see my time, and then I knew Chris did something special. But I still don't think I knew he ran sub-27 at that point. It was afterwards, uh, when we were at the uh, finish, that I realized what he did. And yeah, and then the rest is on video. <laughs> Chris, when did, I mean, did you? there's a famous picture of you, both arms up, as you cross the finish line. Did you know, I mean, obviously you're looking at the clock. So you, did you immediately know, because it's 26.59, that you had ro- broken 27? Or was there still like a question of, did I get it? I think the clock paused. So I think I knew I, I had gotten it. Um, and I was just happy to have won. And I realized as well, trying to break 27, like that I got an American record. And uh, I just, I actually remember a lot of the morning or the afternoon runs that I'd go on on my own. I, I actually tell myself that year, like the whole year beforehand that I was going to break an American record. And it, like, it was just that hit of like, Holy crap, it actually happened. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's uh may every runner have that feeling. Maybe not necessarily the American record, but the, the thing you've dreamed of and actually making it happen. Cause it is mm-hmm. it's a pretty special thing when it, when it comes around. Um, I'm curious to know what you guys like on the Stanford team were thinking here and all the chatter and all that stuff leading into this race. Like obviously you had your race that you were focused on, but like after you got your, uh, I heart New York pizza or whatever it's called. Uh, <laughs> pizza my heart. Shout out pizza my heart. My heart. That, the only place that's open after the race is um, exactly. that you, Elliot and Jagger were, were hanging out. Like how was it as a spectator? I mean, it was pretty awesome. Cause I mean, I, I was, I'm a big running nerd. I was looking forward to the race for sure. I knew kind of some of the stakes, but I was, yeah, like you said, I mean, I guess I think I ran a 1500 that day, so not a real race. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I mean, partly I was stoked cause like, I mean, I was kind of friends with Evan, but he was like a year older than me from, uh, you know, Illinois. He was way cooler. He was a pro and I was kind of let's, like, let's you know, I was trying there. to lay down, I was trying to lay the groundwork for my future you know, Jerry's group entrance. Um, and the kind of the funniest thing I remember about watching it is like, I've been talking to Evan all this time, you know, we're, he's telling me all the stories about like the training, how you fit you guys are. I'm getting really excited watching the race. Like, and so I kind of, I'm taking on, like I'm rooting for you guys really hard and like, I'm going nuts with him. I'm feeding off his energy and like, he's going crazy when the race ends and we sprint from the 200 meter mark over to the, to the finish line. And I, and he goes over and he's like hugging you. And I kind of realized like, I'm like right behind him. Like this guy has no idea who I am. Like <laughs> I, I am not actually a part of the group. So like, I don't know what I'm doing here. And I just kind of like, good job, man. And I just like walked away, but it was, yeah, it was pretty, it, I mean, as a spectator, especially to be that close was, it was dynamite. But where, so, okay. So where, where do you guys, do you guys go to pizza my heart after the race? The only place that's open, what happens after the race? The so half an hour after, I mean, I imagine, I guess I imagine the first half an hour after it's just a flood of people coming up and telling you, you're, you guys are awesome. But do you remember kind of like, was there a moment everyone gathered afterwards and like talked it out with Jerry or did you just kind of like float on into the night? Well, I remember we had drug testing till, I want to say it was like, what, two in the morning, Chris? Weren't we waiting for drug testing? Three. Yeah, it took forever for them to get there. And I just remember right after the race, like when all the interviews and the adrenaline kind of wore off. I realized I had a huge blister and like my foot just started throbbing. <laughs> like it was, a, it was like the whole instep of my foot was a blister. And I, I just remember being like, Oh my gosh, like th- how am I going to train tomorrow? Like that's kind of what I was thinking. <laughs> um, any, any final thoughts, boys, anything we missed? This was, this was awesome. This was great. I mean, one no. thing I'll add is it's kind of cliche to say this, but I tell people to this day, I don't know anybody who trains harder than Chris did. Like that 2659 didn't happen overnight. And I think having Chris on the team dragged me to a Canadian record as well. But there's the amount of talent we had on our team. And I don't think there was anybody who could, who you could pay to run with Chris every day for a week and not get injured. <laughs> it was just, it was impossible. And I think that's, that's the one thing that people don't see when they see 2659 is that dude was unreal. Was is, is, is that word. is that the nicest yeah, thing? Is that the nicest thing Simon's ever said about you, Chris? Yeah, I don't know how to take it. I think there's. It's I feel a, like there's an angle. He's clearly flustered <laughs> by this moment of, of genuine admiration. I mean, it's definitely a weight class world record that's never going to get touched. <laughs> there, we go. there we go. I think uh, it's going to be hard for anyone over 200 pounds to ever break that time. Hey, I'm I'm 
I've started training again, and, and you never know what, what's going to happen. That's, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> i got a lot of time under my hands now. I 25 miles last week. We'll see what I hit this week. Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, I think, Simon, that was a great point. I was trying to kind of get at that earlier just because the, the, the Solinsky reign of terror training stories, they are legendary, and this race was legendary. And you boys. I have a hard time believing that it's still – um talked about what you guys are doing now is uh something of lore as well well that's why we're that's why we're doing this video so we can bring it back we can educate <laughs> the youth on the history of their sport there you go and uh, i guess this is like the 10-year anniversary if we were smart we would have uh we would have like released it on the exact day but i hope hope everyone enjoyed this video i i really enjoyed i don't know just being here listening to these two guys talk so uh thank you simon thank you chris uh, thank you all, everyone out there, and uh, let us know what you think and what else we can bring you on a BTC at home.